Hello everyone, today is Thursday, October 14, 2021. This is the week in charts. Obviously, I just want to thank all you guys and girls for attending. Looks like our numbers are up in spite of me hiding the show from everyone. <laughs> if you if you can't find the show, you don't see it on my website on Thursdays, go to DaveLander.com slash webinar and register even if the date is old, and that'll get that'll get you access to all the shows, including the current one or give you access to the current one, I should say. It. So what are we talk about? Well, current market conditions, obviously, I'm having a lot to say about that. We have a live chart. Your questions on trading, uh, your stock picks, if you don't mind, ask about one at a time. Wait till we get toward the end of the presentation. I want to open it up for live charts and start looking at actual live markets for that. And just ask about one at a time and take care of return. That's just so my ADD doesn't kick in. So <laughs> I just kind of put all this mess into last minute, so bear with me. I want to continue, obviously, my discussion on the trading stuff. And based on one of the posts I saw last week at Facebook, I want to talk a little bit about trading psychology, accepting the trade going in, and then being flippant. And that'll make a lot of sense. And flippant's one of my favorite words when it comes to trading. And then I want to show you a simple system for trend following. And uh, spoiler alert, I think all you guys saw this last week. We talked about it in the Facebook group. And what I'm wondering is, could it be the key to crypto? And it, it might just be with a few little caveats, and we'll get to that. Although I swore I would never do it, I've read my, I guess this will be my third turtle book, or at least two officially. So I did read another turtle book, and I want to give you my initial impressions, good, bad, and ugly. But I do recommend that you read this particular book. The disclaimer screen, as you know, you can lose money trading, or as I'll sum it up, all predictions about the future. And a lot of stuff down between now and then. We'll have to get Greg down again. I haven't seen him in a while. Anyway, I've been talking a lot about this trading stuff, and I've been really cognizant of my emotions and the trades, the good stuff, the bad stuff, the losing, the ups, the downs, the everything else. And that's been finding its way into these presentations, obviously. And I want to unearth some of those things throughout this presentation, obviously continuing along that theme. The one thing I did want to cover is somebody posted in the Facebook group, they had a shitty day in their portfolio. And I wanted to know what was killing it. And he said that YMM is the drag. Well, I recommend that stock, so that's my fault. If it's anyone's to blame, as long as I get credit for the good stuff, then I'll take credit for the bad stuff. And my point was, you don't have to worry about YMM unless it hits the stop. And if that happens, you no longer have to worry about it because it's no longer in your portfolio. So let's take a look at YMM. This is a little unorthodox, but sometimes these IPOs come public, die out, and when they take off again and make that cup and handle or bow tie or whatever the case may be, first pull back after they die out, it can be a really good pattern. And this one's a little unorthodox, but if you squint your eyes, you can see it wasn't a pretty good trend. Higher, almost about 100% run from lows. And it pulls back. So I recommended this one back on the 15th. And there's the parameters there, 1740, 1340, 2140. Entry, protective stop, initial profit target, respectively. So the entry was there, the stop was down here, and initial profit target is up here. And so far, as you can see, it's kind of failed miserably. And this was a day that the gentleman was complaining about his ugly portfolio, which was in part my fault. Well, my point I was making is that anything below the stop, this stock is no longer a problem. Because why? Well, it's no longer in your portfolio. Now, do I drop an F-bomb? Yes. Am I interviewing myself? Yes. <laughs> I like to, and I haven't seen the movie, but I like to do my, what's that guy's name? Paul Giamatti? Imitation of John Adams. I say good day, sir. <laughs> and that usually makes me giggle after I get done with my F-bombs. But anything above those levels is not a problem because it hasn't stopped out. Now, before I imply it's that easy, I did do a follow-up post. I want to kind of let the first little post sink in. 
And I came back with, okay, it's not that easy, but it is that easy. I know. I drop a lot of F-bombs. I get really pissed. As I've said quite often, though, on the service stock, so something that I personally recommend on the service, where I know where my hand is forced. In other words, I have to follow the same advice that I give out. When occasionally I find myself getting aggravated and then I realize it's a service pick. So what I do is I have a separate watch list and or I divide up the portfolio into different segments, my portfolio into different segments. So I have one segment is for intraday trades. If there's something I want to take, intraday trades, e-minis or an ETF or something like that. And I know that at the end of the day, I have to empty out that whole segment. Or, you know, in the case of e-minis, I might um I might ride a little stop overnight like I'm doing tonight on the long side. And I also have a segment for the service stocks. And sometimes I look at a service stock and it's just getting creamed. And obviously I feel bad for you guys. And I also feel bad for myself as channeling Clinton. I feel your pain. <laughs> but then I'll look at it and say, well, you know, it sucks. It's down a couple of bucks or whatever the case may be, or percentage wise down a bunch. But it's nowhere near the stop, and I'm just going to have to ride it out. And it's a lot easier said than done. But on the service stocks, I often find myself getting too caught up in the moment. So let me rewind that. Let me just read what's here. On my stocks outside the service, let's say I take an IPO or maybe something that might be a little too risky to be an official setup or something on the landry list. Like, for, for instance, today I bought puts on. Zim, Z-I-M, which was on the land your list as a possible short. And I want to thank one of you guys for pointing it out to me. And I, I ended up taking the trade. But anyway, I do I do find myself get a little getting a little caught up in the moment because I am human. I'm a very emotional guy, as I said before. I'm very emotional. And that's because I might not have fully cemented the plan and more likely not accepting the risk of the trade or have not accepted the risk of the trade. Now, I've gotten better at this, especially in my IRA, where I know that I hopefully won't be taking money out too soon. I guess from a psychological standpoint, I accepted the risk better there on those trades that are outside the service because I'm not mentally monetizing because I need the money or have quick access to it. So in a non-qualified account, I look at that money and think, oh, I could I could put that towards my pool or my outdoor kitchen or whatever the expense du jour is, my daughter's college education. And, and believe it, it's expense after expense after expense. Anybody who's been alive on this planet, especially in more recent times where inflation's a little bit crazy at the moment. My uh, the, my favorite whipping cream, my wife complains to me every time. She's like, I almost hate, she calls me from the store. Like, what do you need? Like, I need some whipping cream. You know, at $7.15, I'm like, yeah, but I like it. <laughs> How much is your wine? <laughs> no, I wouldn't say that. Yes, what? But anyway, I guess psychologically, I accept the risk better in my qualified accounts because I'm not mentally monetizing it. I, I don't really need the money there or do I have quick access to it. And I kind of see it as I just need to let things unfold. So I have a little bit better, better attitude toward that. And I know that with trend following, a few big winners makes it all work, and I have time there to let it all unfold. So the, I kind of put a lot into this. It is a lot of thoughts in here, and I'm sure I'll probably flesh out a lot of things in upcoming webinars on all this. But the bottom line is you do put time pressure on yourself. Like I'm putting pressure on myself to pay for a lot of things out of my active, personal, non-qualified trading account. But in my retirement accounts, it's like, you know what? I know this trend following thing works. I'm going to just stick with it. And boy, these drawdowns suck, especially when we were up, whatever, 600% on one. We got to watch it whittle down to being up only 500%. I know, I, I, I'll take that on every trade, believe me. And then stopping out. But I know longer term it works and I can see it work. But shorter term with these active accounts, especially when you can minimally monetize that money and quickly just, you know, make a phone call, whatever, click a few keys and get a check in the mail. You got to be careful not to, to, to get too caught up in the moment and let things unfold. The late, great Mark Douglas 
says, what you fear is not the markets, but rather your inability to do what you need to do, what you, when you need to do it without hesitation. And there was another quote from Douglas, and I couldn't find it last minute, but basically he said, if you're stressed out, you haven't, in paraphrasing, you haven't fully accepted the risk of the trade. And by the way, I see you're here tonight. Uh, George, the, the thing is, and I know you're a sponge and you're, you're anxious to just make a million bucks as quickly as possible. But one thing that would that would immensely help you is to just trade at a size that's meaningless and then slowly increase your size and get the reps in until you feel confident in yourself, confident in the methodology, and as importantly, confident in following the methodology. So along the lines of eliminating fear and anxiety. By the way, I did a complete presentation on this and I've probably redone it a few times. And if you go in and dig around on my website, you'd probably be able to find a few of them. And I think a few of them have made them into the members area too. But eliminating fear and anxiety. And, and you know, the last minute I put, I know, ha ha, in there because we're all human, right? But one big thing you can do, as I just alluded to, is accept the loss going in. George says he got it. Well, good. Yeah, and, and that's the thing, George, and, and this is what kills me is I see a revolving door of people come through, and just recently somebody came through, and they never asked for help or anything, and they, they went through this period where I didn't recommend anything, and then I recommended a few things and didn't work out or whatever, vice versa, and they left. And it's like, okay, well, if you'd have told me your struggles or, or told me you were struggling, then I could have said, well, hang on a second. You've only been at this two weeks. Why don't you just watch it for a little while and see what happens? Or better yet, why don't you go back and look at the last three years, four years, five years, the archives are there. I know it's, it's painful to do, but go in and do that. And that means a lot more than me giving you a spreadsheet with everything that, that how it worked, good, bad, and differently. It's much better to actually go in and see them work, what happened, and what didn't happen, what I thought would happen, and what would, in, would actually happen. Again, good, bad, and different. But anyway, except that loss going in. One thing, one thing you can do, and I hate to bring this up, but this is something that I had a conversation with Larry Connors probably 20 years ago about this. And the conversation was along the lines of, if you're not gonna use stops on your trades, which I preach and everyone else preaches, right? Then maybe trade something like long only options where you can, like I said a second ago, accept that loss going in, but you could also have a limited amount to lose. So toward, not that I'm gonna not use stops, is that a double negative? But toward the end of the week, like today and, and tomorrow, on these weekly options, on these ETFs, like sometimes instead of going in, and let's say I wanna trade a thousand shares or whatever, if the ETF is pretty cheap, the option that is to where I'm not risking a whole lot of money, I could say, well, okay, it's only $200 for these options. I know $200 is $200, don't get me wrong. But I can go in and I know that's all the risk that I have to risk and I can manage that risk from there and hopefully flip out the options and improve upon it. But anyway, if you're not gonna use stops and you're not good, you're not willing to accept those losses or whatever, Long only options is something that you might want to consider, but you know, again, I'm hesitant to say that because it does open up a can of worms. But I'm able to. The, the, I think the reason I'm bringing them up is whenever I put an option position, I immediately record a loss of whatever that position co cost me, and then when I sell the option, I'm able to put that money back, and that comes out. Then obviously the cost comes out of the position. But let me get back to this. Except the loss going in, and then. Never forget garbage in, garbage out. So make sure that it is worth the potential loss. So that that kind of circles back to the pre-mortem thing I talked about quite often, or I talk about quite often. I preach and preach and preach about the post-mortem, like after the trade, go in and see how you did and rate yourself not so much on how much you made or how much you lost, but whether or not it was a good setup going in. And one way to get better setups is to accept that loss going in. And if it's a mediocre setup, now not overnight, but over time, you will get enough experience to where you'll say, 
you know what, this is kind of mediocre going in, I think I'm gonna pass. And I'm not gonna put any capital in harm's way. And as I said before, if you're feeling F, yeah, when you look at a trade, you just can't stand it, then by all means, take the trade. Now, if you do lose on the trade, I would, if you reach a point when you lose on a trade, and you could say, I would with 100% conviction, take the same exact trade tomorrow, then you have reached that, that true enlightenment. Now, even if you look back at it and said, holy crap, what was I thinking? That's okay, because you just learned something from that experience, provided you don't say, oh, I just got, I, I was just unlucky, that was bad luck. And if you could separate luck from skill, I'm writing a letter, right? Then you you figure this game out. If you bet, if you blame losses on bad luck, and some, sometimes, of course, if it's a beautiful setup and everything's just all the stars are aligned and everything's perfect, it looks great, and, you know, shit happens, it doesn't work out, that's okay. Maybe you were unlucky, but you got to be really careful. And Annie Duke talks a lot about this in her Thinking in Bets book. I can't get into her Decisions book, by the way, which is her latest book, and I'm sure I, I will eventually get into it, but it's, it's a it's kind of a workbook type of thing, and I'm not really good with that type of uh, – <laughs> I don't like homework. I don't want to be – course with homework I just want to read a book and uh but anyway it's I'm sure it's going to be okay uh no, nothing against Miss Duke but uh her first book or one of her books whatever thinking in bets I would highly recommend you read you can always go to davelander.com slash book dash two dash books dash two dash read I'll put the link in post for you <laughs> I would take that same trade but I would take that MF -er off my watch list Oh yeah, good point, Craig. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, that's that's the that's when I say that's when I say I say good day, sir. Is when it's like I get stopped out, and ten seconds after I get stopped out, I take that trade off of my watch list, unless it's something I think it's set up again, and you know maybe I got TKO'd on it or something, and I'm like, well, hang on, this thing still looks really good. I did get knocked out of it, but if it starts to implode in earnest and knocks me out that's when i take it off the watch list because that will that will mess with your head the beauty of what i do is or the advantage or however you want to look at it is looking at 2000 charts a day and i did the math a while back and i forget exactly how much it is so i'm probably going to under exaggerate believe it or not but it's probably like 10 million charts i've seen over my lifetime or looked at at least trying to figure out the markets and try to find the best stocks and crypto and then occasion is forex and some other things like that on days of that nature but one that's one huge advantage is just putting those reps in and doing that work but one of the disadvantages of doing that is i get to see every stock that moves i get to see every stock that i should have caught i get to see a lot of stocks that i got stopped out of come roaring back and that can be a bit of a, a bit of a mental drain but you just kind of have to power through it but yeah, take it off your watch list and don't let it aggravate you anymore. Now, last week, I guess it was last weekend, something jogged my memory and I was thinking about the 220 EMA breakout system and I started poking around with it again, something I haven't used in many years. But the concepts can't come from it. For instance, the Landry light pullbacks come from that. The Landry light to keep you on the right side of the market comes from that and, and quite a few other things. But I kind of hadn't really spent a lot of time working with the actual system in more recent years. And I noticed that in crypto, a lot of moves were coming out of this system. And my question is, could it be this easy? And the answer is yes, and then, and no, there's a lot of caveats. But before we get to the caveats, here's a system right here. You used to have to pay $1.49 or $2.49, I think, for it. But if you go to just Google 220-day EMA breakout system, and you'll you'll find this. This is a sidebar from Traders Magazine. My whole career was launched, by the way, from, uh, this is actually uh, Stocks and Commodities. Technical Analysis Stocks and Commodities Magazine, TAS, T-A-S-C. My whole career was pretty much launched by this article 
and 96. And that uh, I ended up in a hedge fund or two, and then I ended up by accident in retail on trading markets. It was trade hard back then. And the whole thing kind of launched from this one little silly article with this stupid little system. Silly, stupid system, right? But anyway, that's the whole system right there. I'll walk you through it. Step one, you want two bars of Landry light, meaning the lows are greater than the moving average. Now, the original system used a 20-day exponential moving average. And by the way, the designer's intent was to show that a simple system could work, a simple trend-following system could work, that is. And that's back in the day when I did a lot, a lot, a lot of mechanical testing and mechanical programming, and I later became a discretionary trader. But all that stuff didn't go by the wayside. I learned a lot in the process. I learned it wasn't a holy grail. I also learned that simple stuff could actually work with a few caveats. Now, step two is you're going to enter above the two bar high. Okay, so those couple days of Landry light above the 30 EMA. And again, I used to use the 20 EMA. I like the 30 EMA in more recent years. I know you probably want part of me. And step three, stop out at the 30 EMA. Now, a couple of possible improvements, and I'd forgotten that I did have a tiny bit of a wiggle room entry. If you look at that prior slide, you'll notice that I said enter 10 ticks above the two bar high, and that was for Forex, Japanese yen, or I guess that was, yeah, that might've been the commodity Japanese yen, but it's the same thing, Forex or the futures market. Anyway, so this is your two bar high, maybe give it a little wiggle room so you don't get triggered in on noise alone. And that does help a little bit. And again, I'd forgotten that I already put wiggle room in it until after I put the slide together. But maybe a slightly bit more about amount of wiggle room and then maybe exit on a close below or maybe one day a Landry light. If you're a, if you capture a long, long, long trend, then go ahead and maybe be a little bit more lenient. Now, here's the deal. I wouldn't use this without money management anyway. So I would be taking partial profits along the way and I would be opening up that stop. And maybe my initial stop will be a 30 EMA. And then I would use some of the little money management techniques I talk about, the little games I play, such as keep the change and gaining ground, go into the money management module for a lot more on that, to ride out the longer term trends. And my stop would eventually probably get right around or well below maybe the 30 EMA, depends on the, the trends of the market. Anyway, one thing I did wanna show you, when a market is choppy, a trend following system does not work. Write that down, okay? Now, maybe with a little wiggle room entry, you might have avoided a losing trade there, but you can see that would have been a sell short. You would have gotten long in here, and then this would have been a sell short. And again, maybe a little wiggle room might have helped you a little bit, but then eventually the trend did ensue. And notice coming into this, your entry would have been back here, and this was a pretty damn good trend coming in too. So, as I was putting together this presentation, this is the advantage of teaching a methodology and teaching my thoughts and is that you, you learn a lot in the process. And one thing I was thinking is like, well, not that I would recommend a trading system just based on this, but if you're looking at a market and you see three failed or four or however many failed, three, what would it be, two, let's see, 220 work, 220 sounds better, doesn't it? But 2.30, 230 EMA breakouts, like three in a row, like this, that just chopped you out, chewed you up. Maybe you're due for a trend to ensue. Now, it's not like, hey, what if you flip a coin you know, 20 times, it comes up heads 20 times, and then would you still bet 50%? Yeah, I would, because that's the known odds, provided it's a fair coin, of course. But we don't know the odds in a market. In a market that hasn't been trending for a while is due to trend. Unfortunately, markets, a market that has been trending for a while, the trend may be due to end. But as trend following morons, we just follow along and let the stops take us out. But anyway, after a few whipsaws, it's due to trend again. Now, 
I'm going to get into this in just one second, but while it's in my head, a trend following somewhat of a breakout system like this is going to work a hell of a lot better in an inefficient market than it will work in an efficient market. Now, Bitcoin is probably the most efficient of the cryptocurrencies, but every now and then Bitcoin can really, really, really trend. So the buy was here. And I know everybody here knows this, but to those watching, I have this indicator in Metastock. And it's also in the ACP platform. It's free on both those platforms, by the way. If you have ACP, which is stock charts, all you have to do is like this video and then click on this little plugin right here and you'll get it for 100% free. Anyway, there was a buy, let's see, one, two, yeah, on this day here. So after two green bars, you're ready to look for an entry, okay? And the exit was right there. So that was better than a poke in the eye. Now, by the way, I'm just kind of noticing this as I'm, I knew that wasn't a trigger down here, but your sell signal would have been below this low and notice that it never triggered. And one thing that's kind of cool about this little setup thing is it does keep you out of a lot of chop and that I'm just noticing this here. Technically, I guess you would have gotten a sell signal here, but I might have used a little discretion if I was following this. And this is why I don't believe in a pure mechanical system. I've just seen this live. But see, you've got one, two days of bars of daylight to squint your eyes. And down here, you got two. This just counts the number of days, not the magnitude again. But see, I would see, I would maybe give it some wiggle room to where that wouldn't have triggered. But one thing that's pretty amazing, and maybe I can find a better period of time, is like sometimes it'll just chop back and forth around that 30 EMA and not give you any signals. And I guess this is a good example back here because you've got your you got your buy, you got your sell signal here, and it never triggered it, and the market went back to the 30 EMA, so no capital is put in harm's way. Now, I'm not suggesting that you rush out and trade this in Bitcoin or S&P futures or spiders or anything else at this point in time, but I am making the case that when a market trends, a simple little system like this can do exceptionally well. Now, by the way, on the short side over here, bar one bar two the short would have been right there and you can see it imploded quite a bit before it retraced back to the moving average and then i guess you had another signal back here this one didn't do quite as well maybe with a little money management you could have squeezed a little bit out but anyway getting to the point i was trying to make is everything works better with trend it's a blue bonnet of markets i don't know if some of you people old enough to to remember blue bonnet they still make that in that in blue bonnet like one of those a uh, blue bonnet blue bonnet like one of those plastic isn't, uh, uh, what do you call it stuff, margarine? Isn't that plastic? Anyway, I digress. Just like everything's better with blue bonnet on it, everything works better with trend. So this silly little system works really good when a market is trending. Now, you'll find that it works really good in more inefficient markets. Now, Ethereum's pretty efficient. But let's just take a look at the last signal here. Step one, two bars of Landry light. So that's one, lows below the 30 EMA, that's two. Step two, enter above the two bar high. So your trigger obviously would have been on this day here. And it didn't do a whole lot, but it didn't do anything wrong. And step three, start with a stop at the 30 day EMA, and then maybe take some partial profits along the way and put that money management stuff into place at hybrid money management. Now, again, the point I was kind of anxious to get to is a simple little system like this is gonna work really, really well in an inefficient market. It's also gonna work really well in an efficient market that is poised to make an inefficient move. What do I mean by that? Well, take a look at some big thick stock that's coming off of all time highs and forms a bow tie down or in this case, I guess a three or 2.30 EMA. I need to get used to saying that. Maybe come up with a new name for it. It's hard to change the name after 20 something years, 25 years now, good Lord, I'm getting old. But it can work really well in an inefficient market, I'm sorry, an efficient market that's poised to make an efficient move. So you've got some big cap stock price for perfection, the overall stock market's beginning to roll over. Everybody and their brother owns a stock. Every institution in the world owns this stock. Every analyst in the in the world has been touting this stock. And all of a sudden, 
it begins to implode a little bit. And that's a that's when you get an inefficient move on an efficient stock. And then maybe we'll talk about a few of those. Hopefully not though. But if this market rolls back over, we might have to talk about a few of those. ZIM comes to mind because I have puts on that one. So we'll see. And maybe I'll pull it up in a minute. It was on last night's Landry list. So let's take a look at some of these inefficient shit coins. Now I am long this one. I didn't get long on this this 230 system. I got long because it was going up, like I've been talking about quite a bit, and I was just playing a relative strength game. Relative strength not to itself, but relative strength relative to other of uh, these cryptocurrencies. And this one's worked out pretty nicely as before. So there's your buy, two day buy signal right there. And so far it's ran out pretty good. In a case like this, obviously you would have certainly want to take some profits by now, it pretty much doubled. So make sure you take some profits along the way. FTM, here's another one way back here, believe it or not. And it never did come back and tag that 30 EMA, as you can see. And this is the cool thing about this little indicator. I know, again, you want to part with me. But it, it gives you a visual representation of the trend beginning to develop. Okay, we're making a transition from downtrend to uptrend here. Get ready to get ready. Kind of like the bow tie, proper order. That I preach about so much. Now we have two days. Might be time to start looking at this market. So the entry was way back here. I don't think I got in that quickly. I think I may have gotten in like one of these big bar days when it began to take off. I can go back and look at the trades, which I'll be happy to do for next week. I'll make a note while I'm doing this in post, I guess. Now here was another entry, and this is one trade that I did take around here, not because I had this particular system, but because it was doing well on a relative strength basis. Now, as I'm gonna, spoiler alert, we get to in one second, after a while, all trend following systems tend to look alike, or possibly when a market is really trending, you know, pick your favorite trend following system and knock yourself out. And they're all gonna pretty much look alike. They're all gonna be choppy at times. They're all gonna have horrible drawdowns. And that's why you have to beat the system, so to speak, by using proper money management or what I view as proper money management. Don't risk a lot. Know that you can be wrong a lot. Take some partial profits and let that stop widen out over time to make that transition to a longer term trade. Now here's another one, OMG. There was a signal there. Way back here, you did have you did have a, a buy signal plus two, but you see it didn't trigger. And then your next buy would have been over here. So what happened was this was a reset because it came back to the 30 EMA, okay? And then we have one, two right here, and your buy would have been above that high. And then it tagged the moving average here. And like I said earlier, maybe wait for a close below the moving average. And the reason I want to show you the signal way back here is, of course, hindsight's 2020. But if you'd have been trading the system, so to speak, or something similar to this, maybe RS or whatever, and give it a little bit of wiggle room and maybe take some profits along the way. I mean, geez, it went from five to 10, doubled, right? And then try to ride it out to at least that 30 EMA, maybe a close below. You might be able to stick with the trend for a long, long time. Now we did have a subsequent signal here and it's kind of stealthy. So it's like one, two, and then enter above this two bar high. Actually it was right here. Let's see, this is day one, day two. I might actually have this one a little bit early because this technically right here, I'm looking at it now. So the entry would have been above this high. So it would have gotten you in a little bit later. So right here, the entry would have been actually right there. Nope, take that back, take that back. I see what happened. Okay. So day one, day two, entry above this high, but then it touched the moving average. Okay, so your entry was way up here. This is kind of a cool signal. I know, I know you want to party with me. <laughs> this is kind of awesome. I forgot about this. So this one actually came back down. And then day one, day two, this creates a new signal here, which is actually lower than this signal. Okay. And then it takes off. And I am long this one too. Sheeb, I'm long Sheeb, Sheeb Anu. This is uh, 
This is all a rage on the internet now. I have shares in the millions and millions and millions of this. I guess a lot of people are doing that so they could say they're a shit going billionaire. <laughs> Don't be that impressed. I mean, it's, it's a fraction of a penny. If it goes to one penny, you might not see my fat ass again. I actually took profits on this one and actually got back in, but I, I like it so far at least. But you can see you've got two bars of land you like, so your inner your entry would have been, let's see what that was. Oh, right here. Okay, you've got two. Notice your little land you light above. Okay, no trigger. And uh, stock charts doesn't have this one yet. I'll complain to them because this one overnight went from like way down into the into the like really, really a shit coin all the way up to like number top 10. I saw stuff on the internet and, and all these things. I know, I know, I know. But a thousand dollars, I think like a year ago on this one, be worth 219 million a day. Or something like that. But anyway, day one, day two, entries here. There's your buy. And so far, so good on that one. Okay. Any questions on that system? I know that you guys we talk about things like this all the time in Facebook, but any questions on that? Now, shifting gears, I, as I said before, for various reasons, as I'll get into now, I, I said I'm, I'm never going to read any of those turtle books. And then uh, they were crazy a while back. I say a while back, it's probably 15 years ago, but anyway, or at least 10 years ago. But I remember seeing, hanging out with Larry McMillan at one of the American Association of Professional technical analyst meetings and I said, oh, I'm not gonna read those turtle books. And he goes, you know, that that one that Curtis Faith wrote was actually pretty good. I'm like, really? He said, yeah, you should read that. And he went on to say that he talked about the fact that they, Curtis Faith at least said, talked about the fact they had a ping pong table in the back of the office and they would play ping pong when the markets weren't moving, just the occupied time, so they wouldn't fire off unnecessary training. I thought that was a great, a great thing to learn. And you know me, I'm always preaching patience. So I read Curtis's book and it was actually pretty damn good. And then after that one, I read the, and I figured here's the deal. If I'm gonna read a book about the turtles, I'd rather read one that was written by the turtle than someone else. And then I read his other book, which I think is Trading, Trading from the Gut. And those are all on books to read. I definitely would read that one. That was a really good one too. Now, one of my problems, with these turtle books, especially the non-turtles, is that they're profiting on other people's work. Now, I want you to take the the 230 EMA or 220 EMA, whatever, or my bow ties or whatever, and I want you to go out and figure out a way to make as much money as you can with it. And if you could make money with it, that would be I would be so excited. That'd be fantastic. But don't go out like some people and hold seminars and teach these patterns, especially those who don't even give me credit. I just kind of shouldn't bring this up because it pisses me off. But you know, a few years back, I was supposed to speak. And then two weeks before I spoke, somebody went in and presented my material and didn't give me any credit. And that really pissed me off. But luckily, an audience, audience member let me know. And, you know, I was bitching about it. Greg's like, Greg Marsh was like, let it go, Dave. <laughs> you know, you're right. You're right. You're right. Exactly. Another example I'll give you just real quick. I was in Italy. And and a guy comes out the blue and he's like, oh, I'm a big fan of your bow ties. I'm going to thank you so much. And uh, he's like, uh, can, I, can I get a picture with you? I'm like, yeah. And then he stuck his hand on, shake my hand. As soon as I shook his hand, some professional photographer came around the corner and snapped off a couple of pictures real quick. And before I knew what happened, he disappears. And I think Bollinger was nearby. And I told Bollinger what happened or he saw what happened. And he's like, you know what just happened, huh? I'm like, no, it was the weirdest thing ever. This professional guy comes around the corner. He's like, well, because he's he's selling your stuff, and you just gave him an endorsement, and he's going to use that picture in his marketing material on his website or whatever. It's like, oh, so interesting. So I kind of have a what's a, a sore spot for this type of behavior. There's no holy grail, as I preach. I probably preach too much if I. If I alluded that there was a bit of a holy grail, I probably would have a lot more clients in my educational business. But I could also sleep at night. Now, one thing to remember is all representative systems will look alike. What do I mean by that? Well, 
the 220 EMA and the 230 EMA system are gonna look a lot like the Donkian, if I'm saying his name right, system. I always call them Don Chain systems, but I think it's Duncan, Dunk Chain, or I, I don't know, my apologies to him. And that's a lot of what the Turtles was based on, just a, like a 20 day breakout and then a longer term breakout. But all this trend following stuff will look alike, especially without a lot of money management, especially without taking partial profits. It's going to probably rewrite 73% of the time. I'm sorry, it's probably be wrong 73% of the time. And I've done years and years and years of research on all this and testing everything on the sun. And after a while, they all kind of look alike. You get like a 23% success rate and a 73% failure rate. You want to flip the script on that, trade reversion to the mean, and that'll work until it don't, And which it's interesting. They did talk about that in this book, and I've had some bad experiences with reversion to the mean, two drink minimum on some of those stories. Anyway, all systems will kind of look alike when you can kind of ball them down to trend following, and then with trend following, a breakout system versus like a pullback system or a reverse the deed system for the for the for something that's count, kind of trend. They're all going to kind of look alike. So there's no holy grail. And it's what it, what they're doing, which it's good though, they weren't splitting the atom. They made all the money and they really weren't splitting the atom what they were doing. Now, they were in the right place at the right time. The markets were really, really moving. It was fantastic commodity bull markets for the most part. I think there were some markets on the short side that, that imploded too. The point is though, there's no repeatability in that. Just because they made a lot of money doesn't mean that you can make a lot of money. And also, spoiler alert, a lot of them blew up afterwards. Now here's a thing to remember. If you step on the gas, meaning that if you're using a lot of leverage, you're gonna print money or die trying. Now, I have a lot of respect for Larry Williams when he won a trading contest by turning $10,000 into a million within a year. But I saw one of his lectures, and I don't know where I saw it. Maybe it was a video somebody had or something or wherever. But he talks about the fact that at one point during the year, as I've said, a nauseam, he was up $2 million and he ended the year only up $1 million. He's still in the contest. And as he says, jokingly, is that that's the year, that he tells everyone he made a million dollars, but that's a year that his wife tells everyone he lost a million dollars. And you got to realize that if you're in a trading contest, you have to step on the gas. So no fault to him. He would not have made a million dollars if he wouldn't have stepped on the gas. Step on the gas means use a shit ton of leverage. So if you want to make a lot of money as fast as possible or die trying, in other words, blow up, use a lot of leverage, step on the gas. Now, one of my problems, again, is having Eckert and Dennis as mentors would be of some advantage, don't you think? Now, the other thing is, and I've actually read something similar by someone else criticizing all this. If somebody gave me a million dollars of stipend, okay, so I'd have enough money to eat and maybe pay a little rent or whatever, and a system to follow or lose my job if I didn't follow it, I'd be willing to bet that I could follow the system, okay? Not to take anything away from the turtles. It's all easier said than done, believe me. But it's my understanding that if you didn't follow the rules, whether you made money or not, you had to justify yourself to Dennis and Eckert. And in the book I'm gonna talk about in one second, bunch of traders lost money in Coco and one trader didn't lose money in Coco. And all the traders that lost money on Coco did not get called into the office, but the trader that didn't take the trade and didn't lose the money got called in the office for, for not putting the cap on the harm's way. And he had a pretty good explanation as to why he did it. It wasn't because he wasn't following the system. It's just the way that he laid things out. He would take the, the trades on on He'd fill out one sheet, and after he filled out one sheet, that was the, the trades he took. He just didn't go to two sheets. Now, it's my understanding that most of these guys blew up after the program ended. Not to take anything away from them, but a lot of them fell on hard times afterwards. Now, I just finished The Complete Turtle Trader today, and this is the book I've been alluding to. 
here's my initial impressions. Now, on the title of the book, it says how these traders became overnight millionaires. That's a direct quote. That implies, and so can you, especially since the title is complete. It's kind of like, oh, this is complete. This is complete, you know? So that had me a little skeptical going in. You know, don't judge a book by a cover. Well, seems like that cover was trying to get you to, to buy the book as a get-rich-quick book. I did notice earlier tonight, literally right before I was going live when I was looking up the book online, that the the byline has changed and it actually has the word documentary on the front cover. And it's that's what it's more of. It's more of a documentary, which I think is great. Okay. And I nearly retracted my thoughts on profiting on other people's systems until today. Where when I got to the end of the book, I noticed that he touts his website with the word turtle in the name of the domain. So it's like, well, wait a minute. So you're saying that you're kind of you're one of the turtles or you're selling something off the turtles. And you know, to some extent I'm okay with that. But then it's like after I went, I noticed that Covell was selling a three thousand dollar system. And I'd like to challenge that, that system with my free system I just showed you, that I gave you, or that I just gave you, along with my hybrid money management. Now, I almost didn't say this because I've seen Mr. Covell get pretty nasty with people, get into some pretty serious piston matches. So I almost didn't say it because I don't want to ruffle anybody's feathers, but I just couldn't, it just bothered me when I saw they sell on a $3,000 system on his site. And you know maybe it's maybe it's not turtle related, but the name of the website does have the word turtle in it. So you know I don't know if, if you're gonna sell a system, go go sell your go sell your own system. <laughs> it kind of reminds me. I don't know why it reminds me of this. It's kind of a silly story, but years and years ago, back in my sailboat racing days, there was an older, more seasoned captain, and there was a younger uh, guy that just started racing or whatever. And the younger guy was just a stickler for all these little rules and stuff. And, and, a, and a race isn't won in a in a protest committee hearing. But anyway, the guy, the young guy protested, protested the old guy. And the young guy was just reading the rules, just reading the rules. And it was kind of a minor infraction that the other guy did, allegedly, right? It wasn't like he rammed his boat or did something stupid to cut him off or whatever without the right of way. But anyway, he'd like drift into a channel or something, allegedly, imaginary line of channel. And this guy was challenging it so he, he can get him thrown out so he could go up a notch and, and place in the race. Anyway, well, the, the young guy didn't realize it was the old guy's book he was reading. And the young guy, I guess, had bad eyesight. So he had the book like right up against his, the rule book, right up against his nose. The older guy went and snatched it out and kind of slapped him in the face with it as, as he pulled it away. And he says, get your own effing rule book, you know? So I don't know, it's kind of like create your own effing system, you know? Anyway, I'm, I'm sure that, I doubt Mr. Covell will have a new who I am or, or see this, but if he does, don't don't sue me. You know, I don't want to get in a pissing match, but I, I, you know, I have my opinion. Now, with all that said, do read the book. Uh, it was well written, and you know, here's the thing: in, in writing a book, it's a lot of work, especially a book like this. It's it's a documentary, and I thought he did a, a, an incredible job. You know, a few little caveats aside. And, you know, I was almost, if he had ended the book a chapter early and not, you know, mentioned that he had a turtle website, I, I probably would have been pretty excited about the book. Now, there's some gems hidden in there within that I think that we need to hear again. We've all heard before, we need to hear again. A lot of Eckhart quotes, a lot of more full Eckhart, Eckhart quotes. You see me quote Eckhart quite a bit. And the, they're, they kind of fleshed out some of the, the entire quote, so you get the, the quotes within context. So I would I would do recommend you read it. It was it was a good read. I found it interesting. You know, I'm just a little I got a little aggravation and bias to get some of the stuff as I'm preaching here tonight. Now it did change my mind somewhat on the turtles when they recognize themselves that they could blow up and some were successful afterwards. So what I'm talking about there is, spoiler alert, but what I'm talking about there is, while some of the turtles were off in the back playing ping pong, which I find admirable and pretty cool, right? By the time, you know, be patient, wait for the next trade, let the mark come to you, blah, blah, blah. 
but some of the turtles actually did research during that downtime and when they were waiting on the markets. And it's kind of like the, the student becoming the master type of thing, grasshopper becoming the sensei. They went to Eckert and Dennis and said, look guys, we're trading this system. We're trading your system. We're trading your money management. But we believe, based on our simulations, that we could have up to 80% drawdowns. And when they showed Eckert and Dennis, Dennis immediately stopped everyone from trading and said, cut all your positions size in half. And from now on, cut all your position sizes in half. So they realized that they were stepping on the gas a little too much. And as one of the guys who did this research said, he goes, up until now, paraphrasing, we must have been living right. In other words, we've been lucky up until now for not blowing up. And quite a few did blow up afterwards, but some actually did okay afterwards. And then it's kind of a, a tangible, tangential thing, I guess, where he did talk a little bit about secondhand turtles, not secondhand turtles, but uh, second generation turtles or whatever you want to call them, people who kind of were influenced by it, who became very good trend followers. But, you know, I don't know if you could really connect those dots or not, but read the book and see what you think on that. But it was impressive that some people did become very successful afterwards. But a lot of, a lot of the turtles did blow up. And it appears that Dennis and Eckert weren't like there every day today to be the mentors. Like, hey Dennis, hey, you know, you know, hey Rich, hey, what's Eckert's name? William. Hey Rich, hey Willie, you know, uh, can we take this trade? Should we take this trade? It wasn't like that, according to the book. So I think it's worth reading. Uh, read the books by faith first, but I think it's worth reading. I guess I'm about 15 years late on doing a book review on this, right? Uh, as I said last week, I just want to follow up on this. I'd be willing to bet that one of the next five stocks that I recommend will turn into a big winner. So far, I haven't been too impressed with myself, but we'll see. One of you said uh, being a little uh, flippant, not flippant, uh, a little dangerous to talk like that, a little cocky, maybe the word I'm looking for. Well, here's the next trades, five trades since. We had a better than a poke in the eye trade, and then we made a little bit, and then we stopped out in dats. I did use a little discretion on that one and hung on tight for a little while longer and got out a little higher. But as far as the mechanical results, which I like to talk about, or I'm, that, that, is, that said, I want you to follow things mechanically, but in order to remove all doubt with the position management, if something stops out mechanically, I pull out the portfolio, but I personally might still have a position on like mttr i still have a little bit of that on or by a little bit i mean half of my position but i'm it's on the chopping block and i'm ready to stop out when the time comes ymm is not doing so hot that's the one we just talked about a little while ago as of tonight it's down 19 percent. it's pretty close to stop so we'll see on that one cflt came back nicely today although it's off its best levels it was kind of underwater for a while it's only up 3%. It's a higher price stock, but we'll see what happens. 495, better than Poker Day so far. We still have a full position on. And then number five, I don't know what number five is going to be. I just recommended VX as a short a couple days ago. It did not trigger yesterday or today. So it came off the list based on the big gap that it had today. Anyway, that's something I just want to keep following up on. We got one more trade there. We got one more to see how it's going to shake out. And uh, hopefully, I don't have eaten my words. Or as we say in Cajun land, crawfish too much. All right, let's pop out into the the overall markets, and then we'll uh, we'll talk about any of the stocks you guys want to talk about. So if you want to start asking questions about individual stocks, feel free to do so now. All right, here's the let's get to the S and P 500. Here's the P's. Nice little gap today, nice follow through. Let me check the futures. Futures are firm, not setting the world on fire. I've got a trailing stop in place, a couple of trailing stops actually. One thing that, I, that I've that i been experimenting with lately, and maybe let's take a look at the spiders, might give you a true example. But let's say you take like an intraday trade and 
you risk a very small amount. Now, be, be prepared to get stopped out a lot. But let's say you take like a little morning breakout and you're risking whatever, a couple of points. And then as the market moves more and more in your favor, you're able to open that stop up. And let's say like S&P futures, you might only risk five points, but the market really, really has to be sort of blowing and going or breaking out when you do something like that. And I haven't fleshed it out fully, but sometimes like I'll give you an example. A couple of days ago, I started like right around the close. Sometimes the market will take off or implode and you can go in. And like I'll go in with a really tight stop, like five points. If I could stop out, yeah, I'd do an F bomb. But if it keeps moving, let's say I'm, I'm up five points and it goes to 10 points, then I'll put my trailing stop to 10 points and then I'll let it widen out even further. And it's something I've experimented with a little bit and I'm able to kind of hold on for a little bit longer than that little intraday trade. But anyway, I don't want to digress too far. But while we're on, on the spiders, spiders you get a true open, you got a little gap higher here, a little bit of a dip, but then it took off nicely so obviously a good trim day for those or a holy grail day as i call them for the most part a little gap and go in the nasdaq let's go back to p's just for one second we're uh just a little bit over two percent away from all-time high so this is pretty good and as i've been telling service peeps you and some of you are in here tonight one or two up big updates being all the difference in the world i was pretty bearish lately and today i'm not quite as bearish because the market is going up nasdaq up one and three quarters percent round numbers pretty good day there not too too far away from all-time highs still looks toppy still looks like it's rolled over but back above the moving averages so that's certainly a good thing take a look at rusty i'm pretty encouraged by the rusty this thing has been stuck in a stupid rage forever but take a look at today's action let's take a look at weekly so here's the deal. If this thing breaks out to the upside, it's going to be phenomenal. Unfortunately, if it breaks out to the downside, it could get ugly pretty quick. But I think the Russell could be pretty, pretty cool if it breaks. Oh, look at those funny looking charts. Good looking Fargo. He was funny looking. <laughs> so that's a Russell all over the place. No, no trend following moron stuff to do there. Hey, it's good to trend following moron stuff. Take a look at the energies. Okay. Looking pretty damn good in here. Okay, nice little run higher, bow tie, proper order, looking pretty good. Close at all-time highs, I'm not going to argue with that. Metals and mining coming back, they were pretty ugly for a while, broke down, rolled over, looked like the end of the world, but now they're coming back strong. So one big day makes all the difference in the world. If we close today's gap, then it would get kind of ugly in the overall market in some of these sectors. Gold is coming back with a vengeance, and this might be helping the market out. Not that I wouldn't go after gold trades. Ideally though, as I often preach, I like the gold trades and commodity trades in general coming off of major, major, major lows. Kind of like that CPE last year, which turned into a big winner. But we might see some decent looking setups here soon. Silver a little bit more volatile, a little bit better day at 3%, a little more choppier too. Let's take a look at financials had a really, big day here, not too far from all-time highs. And that's the thing, one big up day or two big up, up days or whatever, when you're still at these high levels, can make all the difference in the world. Real estate, for instance, came back with a vengeance, not too far from all-time highs. I wouldn't rush out and buy it right now, but that's certainly a positive development. Materials of construction, bang up day here. Again, Not it doesn't look fantastic, but coming back with a bit of a vengeance. And we have an MNC stock in the portfolio. That bounced back a little bit today. We have metals and mining stock that rode out this whole thing. Turns out it's a bit of a coal stock. That's probably why it's doing a little bit better. Retail had a bang up day, but still looks questionable in here. So it would, but again, one one more big up day would make all of us the world. This still looks top. It still looks kind of kind of like a bow tie to the downside type of setup, type of situation, I should say. Semiconductors, big rally today, still look a little questionable, but hey, we're back above the 30 EMA. If we can keep climbing up, then maybe we dodged a bullet there too. All right, I think that's enough in the market. You kind of get the idea. It's a fluid situation. It changes quickly. Still looking toppy in a lot of areas. There's that funny chart again. I must have fat fingered something. All right, let's take a look at LEGN. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Um, the only complaint that I have, and I know sometimes I look for perfection too much. My only complaint is that it 
it broke out past these prior highs and it pulled back to them, but it still looks pretty damn good, I have to say. Uh, nice persistent trend in here. This was kind of TKO-ish here, but not really big enough. This definitely qualifies a TKO. So yeah, I think that looks okay. Again, I prefer if it hadn't pulled back, or I, here's the thing, I prefer if it had broken out further before pulling back, but it looks okay. But I wouldn't, this would never make an official recommendation based on the fact that it pulled back to this level. But let me interview myself. Could it pop tomorrow? Yeah. Um, would it be worth a day trade? Maybe. Check on the uh, check on the spread. It's a little bit, not too much thin, but it, it could be a little thin here, maybe. It, it's kind of weird. In more recent times, it seems like stocks take a little bit more volume to keep the spread tighter. I don't know if you guys have noticed that or not, but there's definitely a lot more volume in the market. I think it's the phone traders coming in and and a lot of uh, COVID traders and people like that, quarantine uh, traders, et cetera. All right, any more? All right, going once, going twice, quite a bunch. Well, Facebook has pretty much eliminated the stock picks in here, but that's okay. We we could talk about them. Uh, we talk about them all day, right? All right, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Anything unanswered? You can shoot me an email at dave at davelandry.com. If you're in Facebook, bring it up in Facebook. You're welcome, George. I'm glad. You know, thanks for your input. You know, you you really helped. I I think you helped to make a a better show. Just just you know, seeing you learn trading and seeing you be such a sponge and all and I, I appreciate you being in a group so thank you and thanks for um not being shy and coming out and saying stuff and you know oh you're welcome sam sam says thanks dave excellent as usual well, i wouldn't say always but thank you i appreciate that all right everybody have a great weekend if we don't talk between now and then thank you so much